We have known her for so long, and she's been an original member of the Beacon Hill Women's Forum. She started as a membership person, right, at the desk, and kind of went on from there, became the president of the Beacon Hill Women's Forum from 2016 to 2018, and from there has been our advisor, an amazing advisor. I'm not really going to give that full introduction. I want you to read her full bio on our website, but I think she's going to tell you a little bit about herself more than I could ever. But I am honored and thrilled to introduce Sandra Gilpatrick. Gilpatrick? I have been looking forward to this all day long. I'm so excited to be amongst friends and neighbors today. This is so fun to be asked. I'm so honored. It's the only volunteer thing I haven't done yet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> for. But as I was asked to speak, I thought, what would be the most helpful thing that I could talk about to help other people? And I was thinking about being here for eight years, all the previous, many previous speakers we've had. Not Emily Six in the room tonight or not. I haven't seen Emily, but I was thinking, she is an engineer for like jet engine, she's incredible. And I was thinking, you know what, I bet there's a lot of women in this room who are in the same situation as I am, being in a male-dominated industry, and how do we navigate that? So, that was my inspiration. I thought this would be a helpful idea. So, show of hands, how many of you out there are in a male-dominated industry? I didn't think I was alone, right? <laughs> right? And a few, right? How many of you um, had an area of study in college where you had almost all men in your classes? Yes, you all look at it, you know what that feels like, right? So it was interesting. I took a, my junior year on exchange at Dartmouth College, and I was an economics major at that time. And I didn't really think anything of it, um, but there were all men in my classes, basically. And it was actually cool for me because the dating odds were really good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I was thinking about at the time. But then I went back to Wheaton College, where I, you know, my, my primary school. And even though I was the first class that graduated when it was co ed, it was traditionally a female college, and there were a lot of women in that college. <laughs> Uh, hence my day at Dartmouth, right? So, <laughs> a lot of women there. I still noticed in my economics seminar, my senior seminar, it was pretty much all men again, which I thought was interesting coming from your male-based college, more to female-based, it was all men. Fast forward to when I started working, I remember at corporate functions where there was just a sea of dark suits and just a few pops of color. I was one of those few pops of color. It was interesting, that was 25 years ago. And it was about, if it, I've seen a statistic, about 18% um, women financial advisors at that time. Now, fast forward 25 years later, anyone want to take a stab at the percentage of female financial advisors out there? Yeah, you guys have got our idea. It's about 20, right? It's, it hasn't really changed that much. 2022 has not changed that much. And that's 25 years. Um, and it's fascinating. So when I started off, I started off at Smith Barney, which is now Morgan Stanley. And back then, I mean, through many years, I think I've been in like two class action suits where the financial advisors who were women between certain year to certain year, you tack on to find a class action suit, you got money because you were discriminated against. I'm like, okay, that was a long time ago. You think? I was just reading a fun, uh, an industry um, magazine, and it just happened again like two months ago. I was reading an article about female discrimination in the industry. So it's like this is a long time, and still they haven't figured this out, which is it's so interesting. I wish more women were in my industry because I think the keystone, the cornerstone, core core thing you really need to do my job is relationship building. And ladies, we are so good at that. I think we're better than the men, actually. But that's really what. The core essential part of my job is that is to understand people, empathize with them, know what their goals are, really get to know them. That's relationship building. But what I can tell you is not relationship building is sales culture and high production levels. So, um, if you next, thanks Jesse. Next slide. So, this is the beginning of things. How I start to see things a little differently. You'll see that uh, that 
wonderful crystal paperweight over there with the 15 years, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney on there. So my 15 year award for the company was sent to the wrong address. So I felt so loved, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it started saying something about, you know, where I was working and, you know, I was completely not feeling love at that time. And, uh, you know, to stay in this culture, I thankfully had a little bit of a competitive streak to me that kind of kept me in the game a little bit. But I can tell you, this is sort of the beginning of the end of how I was seeing things. Um, this is the start. So what happened um, shortly after I got that award, I had a baby and I was in my nice office where I could shut the door because there was no pumping room at my office because there were you know, not really any financial advisors and especially young ones that had babies that they had to pump for. So I closed my office door and say, Bessie's in session and start pumping away. It was great. But then um, what happened is I was on this team of two older fellows. Now, the culture that came from this Wall Street firm was really to make teams, not to be a solo practitioner. You have a big group, a team. The problem with my team is we had one old fellow who was buying individual bonds for clients, and we had another old fellow who was doing a stock portfolio. And if any of you are familiar with the industry, those are very commoditized things, and that's actually probably the easiest part of the job, and no one's really doing that specifically more. What my role was was a certified financial planner. My job is to get to know the clients, to really help them with their goals, and that's really more what it's about. And they used to tell me, Sandra, you're the most valuable person on our team. I'm like, great. They didn't give me one single percentage more in my partnership split. They refused to do it, and so the problem is I could never hit my production goals. So what happened was they kicked me out of my door office. I got put out in the open space with all the sales assistants because I was not meeting my numbers because it was basically impossible in the partnership split that I was in. So that was sort of the first big kick, the writing was on the wall. That was a tough one for me to hit. Um, what also happened was, you know, I have a baby at that time, moving into toddler, I'm thinking ahead. Well, what happens when they have school breaks, when they have snow days, and then nurse calls, you know, all these things that you have to worry about when you have a young child. And my husband travels, was traveling like half the month. So I had to be the one that was on duty on a call. And I was thinking, how on earth am I possibly going to manage this with a child and being on full duty? And it was just all too overwhelming. Uh, oh, next slide. So this was my little one at the time when I was making these decisions. And you'll see, I, um, my husband and my son look wonderful. I think I had not more than three hours sleep for my first three and a half years of my son's life, so I do not look as wonderful as that. <laughs> but um, what I did have is after 17 years of experience at the White House, this Wall Street firm, I gained so much knowledge and so much experience, I knew it was wrong. It wasn't really what was going wrong with me. Honestly, it's, I was thinking, I was in my 30s then, what would happen if I wasn't a financial advisor, if I was just a professional woman, you know, earning a good income, have a great career track, and if I was out there, who would help me? Like, who would help me? And I was thinking in my old firm, like, they wouldn't even pay me on an account that was under $250. $1,000. They wouldn't pay in like how many 30 year olds have, you know, a ton of assets, millions. It's not too many, right, at the age 30. So I was thinking, who would help me? This is an underserved market. Young professional women need help. And they just did not see these large Wall Street firms being able to help these young uh, women. So this is a really timely talk. I know April, I know there's one person here, my friend Suzanne would know that April is Financial Literacy Month. Because, <laughs> uh, yes, Suzanne. Suzanne's also, it's her jam to do financial literacy. And, uh, oh, next slide on the financial literacy. So people think financial literacy might not go through all social strata. It does. Financial illiteracy, I will say. So it's not just people who don't have a lot of money, it's people who have a lot of money that don't necessarily know. So this is my grandmother and my grandfather. And what happened was, my grandfather, like so many of my clients that come to me, the men are making the financial decisions. They're, they're telling, they're, they're in charge of the money. The women often aren't, aren't doing it, right? So what happened was, even though they had a good amount of wealth, my grandmother 
mother did not know how to write a check when my grandfather died. So she was totally not prepared to take over the finances. So um, one of my missions is to empower women so they understand what you really need to know. So you don't have to love financial planning or investments. You just need to know these certain basics. Women just need to know enough about their money. It's so important. So that's you know, the mission of my business as well. Another reason I want to focus solely on women. So it dawned on me, the key to success in my industry is actually to differentiate yourself and have a niche target market, right? Uh, next slide. So I thought, you know, duh, my superpower actually isn't like being everyone else. I was just actually in the wrong place to work. So um, I started, my, so what happened? So this is actually a photo of my own logo. And of course I hand out dark chocolate, Belgian chocolate, because that's what my clients would like, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's different. Um, so what happened was, so it was really tough and sad the time to make the decision to leave a firm I'd been with for a 17 years, a very long time. It's always a hard decision, but I saw the writing the wall. I had to get out of there. I knew I was not in the right place where I could succeed, and I was just being, I was absolutely miserable there. I had no confidence. I mean, if I was making under a million dollars there, I felt like dirt. So it was a very tough place to be, so I knew I had to get out of there. So I started interviewing at a whole bunch of different places, and I was really well received. You know, I had clean compliance record, I'm young, I'm female, experienced, certified financial planner, at least checking off all the boxes. I was finding, you know, a lot of people did want to hire me, so I was telling my husband this, and he says, why don't you just start your own practice? I'm like, did not even occur to me to even think that, because I had no comments for that. I had grown up on learning about teams, and you had good teams, you don't do solo, and I just didn't think, honestly, I could do it. I wasn't even thinking about it. Um, it's also very scary. So not only are you starting at zero, when you start a business, you're actually starting at negative. Because I know when I, my costs are about $30,000 a year with rent and website and everything else, it's expensive. So you're in the hole the minute you decide to start your own business. So thankfully, I am a financial planner, so I was planning. I did a budget, I figured out how long I could live with no money. I figured it all out. So people were saying, oh, you're brave to start your own business. I'm like, well, you know, I'm a little brave, but honestly, I can't say I'm completely brave because part of the reason it would work for me, to be honest with everyone, is I have a second income at home. So without having a husband's income, I don't know if I actually could have done this um, the way I've done it in the more relaxed fashion um, that I did do it. So I have to be completely honest for you for all women who are thinking about starting a business. It is not easy and it has to be very well planned out and it's not always the right decision for everyone depending on your circumstances. But um, I have to say that, oh, next slide, thanks. <laughs> so fast forward to nine years later, and this is actually one of my favorite photos nine years later, where's Susan? This is a Susan Simon family portrait. So my favorite photographer back there. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> so nine years later, it ended up being the best move I ever made. So I more than doubled my income. I, um, I had equity in my business. I have flexibility in my schedule to do what I need to do, right? And I gained a great skill set being a business owner. And best of all, of course, I create business where I can really help women. So two things I want everyone to take away. Um, first is sometimes you just need that extra kick. It's really hard, you're really sad, this can be really disappointing, but sometimes you just need to pivot. And if you pivot and you become open to opportunities, you can actually upgrade your situation. Even though it doesn't seem like it at the time, it's really hard to see through that. You can really, if you pivot, you can find something better in life. And the second thing is, um, that I wanna point out is um, being different. It can be really uncomfortable. It can be really awkward too, right? But, um, 
It can really be your superpower as well, being different. So I hope those are two things that everyone in the room can take away from. And thank you for letting me speak. Anyone break? Back to the room. Were you able to take any of your clients over? So it's interesting. People know now there's a different protocol with the wirehouses where you used to have to follow a protocol where tombstones, it's very legal. And my former partners actually came after me with um, an attorney. Um, completely ridiculous. I was not like a big fish. They, I think, it was spiteful. Where I did do everything right, but they said, "Oh, you stole clients' information. Do not technically just bring anything with you." I emailed. I had a client email because I memorized it because I had been clients with them for like over a decade. So of or course you know I wrote email. Exactly. So they tried to come after me. They couldn't nail me. I think because I did really do nothing wrong. But it's very. It's even now more particular that there's no protocol per, um, anymore. And it's actually they're, they're very mean and nasty now. Even worse to move. So it's very, it's even harder now to bring oh, clients yeah. with you. Oh, uh, here, you were so brave. I don't know if I'm gonna throw this at you. These are my challenges. Maybe that's a question you can talk about. Yes. So, um, so I'm in the same industry. Oh, did you know? Okay. Um, I was like in an all white male firm, only person of color that wasn't a secretary. Yeah. Um, I have my CFA now. But to her point, how did you actually get your clients to come with you? So here's the thing. The reason that's a really good point. So actually, one of the reasons I left is because they weren't my clients. They're two old white guys, right? These old guys. And I felt like they weren't my people. The clients I was servicing were not my people. So actually, I didn't really want to take anyone with me. I kept like three or four. Like it was honestly kind of one of the young people I wanted to take with me and did take with me. It was not many. So I actually started from zero on purpose because I did not want their people. I wanted my own people. So that's actually why I don't buy a book of business from someone else, because I want them to be my people. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have instincts. Oh. <laughs> I'm not athletic. So. So, I, so I have two questions. It's one, how did you build your um, office front, if you will? And also, how did you build your clients? Such a good question. So. Um, Office front, you mean branding or? Just your space to, to do your work. And oh, this is funny. So I came over originally to LPL Financial through my old squash partner from Smith Barney who also left Smith Barney. And he's like, here's some office space I have. There's a space next to me, why don't you come? And then here I am like nine years later in the same space, randomly, like it was not intentional, but ended up being a really good move. He'd done the research, got lucky on that. But um, the question, how about, oh, I always thought like a friend of a friend thing, word, word of mouth, like I want to be with, help people who I really actually cared about. So I'm actually, I can choose who I want to work with. I don't have to work with just anyone. So it's people I would care about are friends and friends of my friends. So that's the really the root of what it is. But my SEO is so high that I'm getting like Google hits. I'm like, okay. So I screen people to make sure they're the right fit with me. And they can be, even though they're not friends and friends of friends, like I expected. <laughs> yes. Are you currently taking on new clients? <laughs> yes. But um, I always do a like a gratis, like a complimentary, like thirty minutes with someone just to make sure we are the right fit. Because not only is someone interviewing me, I'm also interviewing them. Because if I'm going to take on a relationship, it's time out of my day, it's time out of my life. It has to mean something to me, and I have to care. It has to be able to work. So um, yes, I am taking on clients, but you know I'd like to have that thirty-minute talk before just to make sure I'd be a good fit with that client. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Oh, so <laughs> bad. Oh, my God, so awful. By the way, on my homepage, that I actually have like who is my client, like right in front of your face. So it's no surprise who it is. Um, it's indeed. Well, somewhere. I'm just thinking like. You with your family and your son, and I know you're so involved with the Garden Club and the Vincent Club and all these other things. Like, how do you manage all that? How do you juggle all that? Okay, I was gonna give two chocolates to the one question I hear the most. How do you do it all? Yeah, that is the question I get the most. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> ah! two. <laughs> one for Holly. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, that's a question I get all the time. So actually, it's funny that you asked me that question yeah. specifically because. The one thing that has gone for me that has always gone first for me is the last thing, first thing I'll give up is my 
um, workout. <laughs> So I have gained weight, I noticed, um, you know, I took my CFP, I gained weight when I do this. That's the first thing that always goes for me, actually, is a workout. So I do everything else. I think I usually don't go more than four days without working out. And then I do strength training, so like under all this fat, there is muscle. Like, but, but, you know, I, I really, it's funny, when you start doing it, they always say, ask a doer to do more, because they want to start doing it, and that's kind of what just happens. You just kind of start rolling with it and doing it, and the more you do it, I guess the easier it gets, because you've done it already before the rolls, so it gets easier, but honestly, the one thing I do is I have to gain weight, so I can't, that's the one thing. Yes? Are you solo, or do you have other people working with you for you? Yeah, so the cool thing about coming from the wirehouse where they had all the support in the world, they're taking care of everything for you, I didn't want to go what's called an RA, registered investment advisor, where you're just hanging your shingle up and you're doing your own compliance or anything. I couldn't go there, so I joined a firm that actually does, has the same structure. The large wirehouse firm has a very large LPL, like a mass firm, just as big. So they actually had that whole structure in place for me. They have my compliance, they do their statements for me. So where I have my own practice myself, I have a huge operations team behind me. I have a tax department, a retirement department. I also have a supervisor in Waltham that has 90 knees under him. So it's my double compliance. So they also do compliance. Did you say 90? 90, 90 knees. It's a, it's a massive firm. It's just as big as Morgan Stanley, like um, Salesforce wise. But you wouldn't know because we brand, brand ourselves differently because we're unique and I do my own branding. So once I follow all the guidelines, compliance, and follow the rules, I can do what I need to do. Does that help? Oh, wow. Well. Oh, I bet on that one. Okay. Oh, yes. I have a question about investing. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the current investment climate? So this is a compliance-oriented thing. So I'm not allowed to, I mean, I'll have you chat offline with you, but I have to get compliance approval before I really would say anything investment oriented. That's why I look at this through about, this is not, I will be happy to talk with you. It's not as dire as you think out there. So I'm happy to chat offline though. We're saying investment, I'm staying away from investment specific questions without compliance, because I have this clean track record for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and they do have any, any, any more? Oh, I'll go to the back. Allison, another woman who came from the male dominated industry. Yep. So you have, speaking of men, a wonderful son. Does he, wonder, does he understand what an awesome and smart mom he has? And how do you impress upon him that women can do things and how he needs to look at women that way and understand that they have skills just like he does? How do you help him move forward to be a wonderful partner to whoever he winds up with? That is such a great question, Allison. Thank Don't try so and get the chocolate back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. He actually inspired me to do a, um, a whole series of financial literacy things, how to teach your kids about money. So my child's been saving since like age four for a house. And I tried to wow. give, so it's funny. I was looking around, and there were no, no, really not much out there. There's so few moms that are financial advisors that are talking about this. So I decided to start like this whole series about that topic. Um, uh, as a side, but you know, that's a really good question. How to how do I make him a good mate for someone, right? Um, he cooks really well. By the way. <laughs> one good thing I have worked very hard on my um, my uh, side fun thing to do is baking and cooking. So he's actually very good at that. But he so he's really good managing money so much so that I trust him. He is a co-signer on my credit card at fourteen. So he's extremely good with money. He will call me if he's going to go to lunch and spend twelve bucks. Like mom, can I do this? Like he's he's like. I set the bar at five dollars. If it's more than five dollars, you have to think about it. For someone who's you know younger, five dollars is a lot of money. I'm not making a lot of money it's for five dollars. So I've done a very good job of teaching about money management. But I'd say probably the best sort of sub osmosis I hope thing is my mother didn't really work. So I hope she set an example for my son that I'm working weekends, I'm working long hours. It's really important to me. It's important to our family income. I'm hoping that's saying a good example for him to show him, yes, I can do what Papa's doing, and uh, we have now, now, thankfully, almost equivalent income, so he's not gonna think that, you know, his father's making more than I am, and he sees George taking care of him, and it's not, you know, he's, we're very good as much as we can to split duties, so I hope we're just saying a good home example 
to be even partners for him in the future. The best I can call it. That's to be their true, their true selves, right? That's what everyone is sort of talking about right now, to everyone be happy, and it's not just about only about earning money. Um, I mean, it's great if you find a job that you, if you want to earn money with your lifestyle, whatever wants and matches, it's great. Um, you do want to be happy. How would I tell someone? It's a good one. Be open to new opportunities and different things that you wouldn't expect. So this is my second pivot, like that, this is a really big pivot for me to start my own practice. I just went through a really big pivot just a month ago. Be open to pivots and new opportunities. My son did not, he's waitlisted at, to the schools I thought, like especially one in particular, I'm like, it's where I've always wanted to go, it's the right thing, I was in love with this school and I thought they loved us and they, only waitlisted us and we didn't get in. So we had to pivot to a different plan B after being like gut punched and heartbroken. And honestly, this pivot, I think it's the right place. It, it's the right thing and I didn't necessarily think of it at first, but this pivot this is again, the second pivot, it ended up being the right thing and the right opportunity and you just have to be open to those things and things don't go your way. Sometimes it's for the best. Especially since <laughs> like this is amazing. 